Hallelujah, hallelujah. Good morning, Kings Lahaina. How are we doing? Hey, good morning, online family. Thank you for joining us. Let us all stand. Let us all rise. Let us lift our hands to the Most High. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day, Father God. That we can just give you praise and we can give you thanks, Father God, for what you're doing in and through us, Father God. I pray that this service, that you would have your presence, your Holy Spirit will be here, Father God. And we just praise you and we give you all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Oh, hallelujah, church. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? So come on, let's put those hands together and let's worship the King of Kings. Can we the fight? I'm slowly drifting. A bag of all. Just when I ran out of that love, I met a man I didn't know. He told me that I was not alone. He picked me up, he turned me around, placed my Solid ground, I thank the master, I thank the savior, cause you heal my heart, you change my name, forever be I am not the same, I thank the master, I thank the savior, I thank God. I cannot deny what I've seen, got no choice but to believe. My doubts are burning, like ashes in the rain. So, so long to my old friend, burning in bitterness. You just can't keep it moving. Now, you ain't welcome here. From now till I walk, streets of gold, sing up how you.
trample the darkness. singing because all I can hear is the Lord speaking right now so just listen because he's speaking right now personally to you he's speaking right now and praise you Lord because you're taking us deeper you're taking us deeper <laughs> steal the words of the song and just speak to me Lord <laughs> I don't have to sing the real words to the song just speak to us Lord we just want to hear your voice take us deeper take us deeper take us deeper Lord
morning church we've arrived at our healing time and this is a part of service where we believe in breakthrough amen you know the Lord gave me dreams last week and in the dream he was telling me tell them about faith you know you must have faith to please the Lord how do you get faith you got to step out you have to hear the word of God amen this is what the Lord showed me. In Matthew 17, 20, he replied, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible to you. Nothing will be impossible to you. Have you ever seen a mustard seed? It's right here, it's tiny. 
You want to know why I think that the Lord showed us a mustard seed? Because it's the smallest among all seeds. You know that it's an herb, but when it's planted, it grows as large as a tree where birds can come take shelter. You know, weeds don't even do well uh, next to this shrub, next to this herb. Why? Why did the Lord use this? Because he says he can do all things, all things. He can tell that mountain to move and it will move. He is the Lord. He is the creator. Amen. All we have to do is have faith in the Lord Jesus. Whatever you ask him in prayer, when two or more are gathered, he will be here. He inhabits our praise. Amen. He is here. The spirit of God is here. What is it that you're believing for? What is your heart crying out for? There might be things from your past. There might be something you're going through right now. Your family member, you're crying out to the Lord. Today's the day you step forward. Faith as a mustard seed can move mountains in the Lord Jesus. So we're going to call our pastor and minister and those assigned to pray to please come up. We want to believe in with you today that the Lord's going to break things off of you. Amen. There's no darkness in your eyes. There's no question in your mind, God Almighty. God of mercy.
praise Jesus. Oh, the presence of the Lord is here. As we prepare to uh, pray for the vision of this house and for one another. Thank God. Praise God for a house that believes in prayer. Amen. So take that hand of the person next to you if you know, you're, you're with them, with their family. Praise God. And let's lift up the vision in one another. Oh, Lord God, we just lift the 12, 12, 12 vision up to you, Lord, for Lahaina, Father God. Lord, that across all of our ministry platforms, Father God, of all ages, Lord Jesus, that we will see 1,200 people in this house every week worshiping and praising and declaring the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord God, and none of those people, Father God, we're praying and believing for leaders to be risen up, Father God, that we will have our 120 life groups every week meeting in Lahaina, Father God, in our schools, Lord Jesus, at the beach, in the public places, Father God, in our homes, Father God, that there will be a place, Lord God, in this town that someone could not experience the power of your love. And Lord, I just pray that you just release your understanding of generosity, Father God upon this house and upon its people, Lord Jesus, that we will see $12,000 a week given in the offerings, Father God. Lord Jesus, and as we hold nothing back, Father God, we know and we believe that you won't hold anything back from us, Lord God. And right now, I pray for everyone in this congregation. Oh, come on, church, link your faith and intercede for that person. Oh, Lord God, we pray, Father God, that you would just bless your people today. Lord God, that whatever they may be facing, Lord God, whatever trials they may be going through, Father, that your hand is interceding right now. Lord, that your hand is in their situation, Father God. Lord, that as we as we just continue, Father God, to walk in you, we will be blessed, Father God. We will see our, our hopes and our dreams come true. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people say, amen. Welcome, online family. Welcome. Greet each other. Aloha and welcome to King's Lahaina where we experience life with people, power, and purpose. Join us every day of the week for early morning prayer at 6 a.m. where we come together to pray corporately for our community, our church, as well as individual needs. Let's pursue Jesus together. Join a life group today where you can dive into the Word of God as well as pray and fellowship with others. See one of our leaders to find a life group that fits you. Don't miss our midweek service every Thursday at 7 p.m. Come engage in worship and be refreshed with an encouraging word to finish out the week. At KC, we provide a place of worship for a variety of ethnic communities, such as Tongan, Spanish, Marshallese, and Filipino. Check our website to be a part of our ethnic ministry services right here at Kings Lahaina. Stay connected with us on social media. Follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For more information, see one of our leaders or visit us at kclahaina.com. Thank you for joining us today at King's Lahaina. We hope you enjoy the service. The service so far. Hallelujah. Good morning. Good morning, King's Lahaina. All right. Anybody here for the first time this morning? We want to greet our new people. Anybody for the first time? Is it your first time to Lahaina? I've seen you at the cathedral before. What's your last name? Cruz. The Cruz. Cruz. The Cruz Ohana is in the house with us this morning. God bless you, Cruz. All right. Let's welcome our guests on the count of three. One, two, three. Aloha. And God bless you. Hallelujah. All right. Here comes my husband for the Lord's tithe in your offering. Uh, before we continue, can we have the Matias family come up? We just want to pray for them. Amen. You know, as a church, we rejoice with one another and we also weep with one another. Amen. Um, they just lost her father. So let's just pray God's comfort upon them. Amen. And if we can have them come up, please. And if I can have all my leaders come up. All right. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come before you, God, and we just ask your comfort, oh God. Our words are limited, God. But Lord, you are unlimited, God. And I just pray the comfort of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to come upon this family, God. Lord, that you would strengthen them and you would walk them through this, God. Lord, that you would be their strength in their weakness, God. 
And Lord, we just look to you, Lord, because you are a faithful God. So strengthen them, comfort them, Lord. The whole family, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. You guys ready to give? Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'll be reading out of Luke. Luke 21, verses 1 to 4. Luke 21, verses 1 to 4. Hallelujah. And the Word of God reads, And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, truly, I say to you, that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God. But she, out of her poverty, put in all the livelihood that she had. Amen. How many of us love this passage? Right. That's what I thought. <laughs> Not much people love this passage. You know why? Because it goes against everything that we are. You know why? Because it speaks to our wallet. You know, and I forget who said this, but he said that the last thing to be converted is your wallet. Amen? We receive salvation, but you know, sometimes we need to pray for our wallet to have salvation as well. Amen? Because we try to, we try to withhold See, even in my own life, it's, it's challenging. But we see in this passage, you know, for the rich people that were giving, you know, it was easy for them to give. How many of us know it's easy to give when you're able? Yeah. See, so for the rich people to put in what they did, it, it, it didn't challenge them. It, it was like loose change to them. But when we look at this widow, this widow was without the husband. She had no source of income, and whatever income she had, it was little, but even with the little she had, she put in the offering bucket. And I'm not telling you this morning to put everything you have in the offering bucket. You can read, oh, thank you, Jesus. See, but what I'm telling you is, give what God asks you to give. Amen? You know, sometimes when we give the 10%, we think we're giving everything we have, but actually, we're not. Because God says to test him in this and see if he will not open the windows of heaven over your life and pour out blessings so great that you can't even contain it. See, this woman didn't trust in her resources. She trusted in the source. She trusted in God because she knew that everything she has comes from God. She was a widow without a husband, but the Bible says that God would be a husband to the widow. That God is faithful to provide. And I'm telling you, church, God is faithful to provide your every need. Amen? Amen. How many of us wants the window of heaven to be open over our lives? Amen. I mean, amen, I do too. But it comes with a condition. We must give, right? Your hand controls the window. Once I give, the window opens and the blessing pours out. Amen? amen. So if you guys are ready to give, you can raise your hand. We can get you an envelope. If not, we have three ways to give. Here on screen, you can give by envelope. You can text to give. Or you can go on kclahaina.com. Amen? You guys ready to give? Before we continue, can you go on King's Chapel Lahaina Facebook page and share it? And then um, above that, right post, say, there's still time for you to get to church. <laughs> oh, yeah? You guys can put that on. <laughs> well, let's pray. Father, we just come before you, Lord. And we trust you, Lord, just like that widow. But we thank you, Lord, that we're not giving everything we have, God. But we're giving to you what you ask of us, God. And we know that you're a faithful God. That we're not going to trust in the resources, but we're going to trust in the source. We know that every good and perfect gift comes from you, God. So, Lord, I pray, God, that you would bless the seed of the giver. Lord, that you would increase them, Lord. That not only their needs would be met, but that they can be generous on every occasion to see your kingdom come and your will to be done here on this earth. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Well, this morning, I have the awesome privilege to introduce a man of God, a mighty man of God. No stranger to this house, no stranger to kings, amen.
But uh, before I introduce our guest, you know what is amazing to me? When, when, when I look at Prophet Jim Critcher, you know, uh, no, no disrespect, but when you look at him, it's like he's just a cool guy. Like he's laid back, you know, he's like you, you wouldn't expect much, right? And I mean that in a good way. <laughs> but you give this guy a microphone and he gets up on that stage, he's like, who is this man? <laughs> hey man, he, like, he, he doesn't look anything like what you see. So, you guys are in store for a real treat, amen? Let's give a warm welcome, King Chapel Lahaina, to our prophet, Jim Critcher. Let's stand up. Let's welcome him. Hallelujah. There we go. And look at that. My wife's going to take my mask. <laughs> Hallelujah. You may be seated this morning. You know, I, sometimes I don't feel like I really fully belong at KC because all the real speakers, you know, they have people stand and shout and clap and do things and then stand up and shout again, you know. And we're, I'm just a boring guy, you know, from, from Washington, D.C., and just keeps everybody just seated the entire time. So, uh, so I was raised Episcopalian, and that helps any, where you stand and sit and kneel and you know, then sing and then shut up and sit and kneel again. And so, I, but anyway, but it is such a delight to be here. So happy of how God is just expanding this house here in Lahaina. Uh, my wife and I have been coming to this conference at KC for well over two decades now. And I don't know how many times I have probably uh, ministered in this church and just seen it through you know, different iterations of leadership and different stages of its growth. And yet it seems like in the midst of that God has breathed on this house in a very, very unique way. Amen. Amen. And, you know, I, I would encourage you, don't ever look at that as just saying, yeah, well, that's the KC way. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe not. But what's important is that God has placed you here in this moment for a reason for the season. <laughs> that would almost preach, but I'm not going to preach that, all right? But I believe, and I, I, I ministered this yesterday morning at the conference, I believe that we are in a moment of historic proportions for the church. I believe that. And that's not just trying to make a good conference message or just trying to set up a sermon this morning. I believe in every Everything that's on the inside of me that can believe, in spite of what my eyeballs tell me, in spite of everything going on in the world, I believe that God is setting up something that is, is absolutely historic. And ladies and gentlemen, he has allowed you the privilege to be alive in this moment. And not just to look at it and applaud it from a distance, but you are in the middle of it. You are in the midst of what I believe is going to be one of the greatest awakenings and outpourings of history. Not modern history, but history. Okay, all right. Well, that, that would have been a really good moment for you to have done something Pentecostal, but that's... But that's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get there eventually. All right. Um, go ahead and turn your Bible to the book of John this morning. And, you know, I'm not a real smart guy. So what I have to do is I just have to stay in my pay grade and preach what I know. And uh, John, the 11th chapter, all of us who have been around the church for a moment, maybe raised in Sunday school, we know this story. And the story, of course, is, is about Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. Now, it's interesting in my Bible that it says right here, at, 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 you know, the little headings that you have in your Bible? You know, it says right here, the death of Lazarus. You know, it's interesting to me that the death of Lazarus is not what the story is about at all. The story here is about the resurrection of Lazarus. But it's interesting that every Bible that I have that has these little headings in there always refers to this passage as his death. But 
Everybody dies. But how many people who die get to experience a bodily resurrection? I mean, this is only one of a handful of, of accounts in the entirety of Scripture where we see the dead actually raised. Now, I believe it happened a lot. But I'm talking about what we can point to in this Bible. Amen? Amen. And as we came into this year, you know, I began to ask the very same question that everybody else was asking. God, when, come on, when is this, this meaning the pandemic, everything attached and associated with the pandemic, God, when is this dealing with? Going to what? Be over. Why? Because we're humans. All I wanted to do was eat in a restaurant and 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 scratch my face and 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 you know scratch my nose. I mean, everything that you know the government said, don't do that. You'll die. I mean, all of a sudden, that's all I wanted to do was go eat in a restaurant, hug somebody, and scratch my nose. And But I was, like you, I was sick of it, tired of it. And so I began to ask the question that your children ask when they climb in the back seat, are we there yet? (laughs) And so the manifestation of my impatience and my immaturity, you know, is what propelled that question. Not unlike the disciples sitting with the resurrected Jesus in Bible study. Asking of all the questions they could have asked. Can you imagine this? I mean, here's Jesus talking about Acts, the first chapter. It says that for about six weeks, he's between the time he was resurrected and the time he ascended, he sat with those disciples and he what? He taught them. How many of you would love to have been in that small group? Come on. I mean, and don't you think the disciples were probably listening a little differently to Jesus' teaching? After it's just like, the dude was dead, and now he's not. I'm listening now, all right? And of all of the things that they could have asked him, what did they ask him? It was a question of what? Timing. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel at what? At this time. I mean, once again, here's everything they've experienced, everything they have witnessed, and they're still trying to figure out what? Times and seasons. They're still trying to figure out dates. And we're still doing the same thing today. Interesting. And yet, how many of you know Daniel 2.21? He changes times and seasons. He's not just the architect of the circumstance of the season. He is also the architect of the timing of the season as well. And I don't know about you, but I've never been able to get out of a season earlier than God had ordained. Hello? It's a little bit like my wife baking bread. And you know this, this is just, you know that moment where you walk in the house and it's like, Oh, I don't know what it is about bread being baked, but you you know it has this odor that you're just, (laughs) I mean, and those of you that are doing keto that don't do bread, (laughs) could I suggest to you that it's an antichrist spirit (laughs) behind the keto diet? Why? Because Jesus referred to himself as the bread of life. And so that, come on, brother. Come on, Jacob. You know what I'm talking about. And so any diet that would preclude bread has to me some essence of the Antichrist spirit that is attached to it. So if you're doing keto here this morning, repent. That's all I've got to say. But there's something about the smell of bread baking that just does, it just, prepa- it just draws you to it. And so I'm there, and I'm just like, and I love bread. My dad loved bread. I love bread. My kids love bread. My grandkids love bread. We've got strong genetic material that's predisposed toward bread, let me just tell you. And you know how you, you, you go to the oven, and you're just like, is it done? Is it ready yet? 
and, and, and you pull it out, and sometimes my wife will, will kind of pull it out, you know, and it's just like, now, n- now, and she'll thump it because she's got this, you know, and it's, just, it's not done yet. And that's never what I want to hear. And what does she do? She shoves it back in the oven. A lot of Christians jumping out of the oven before God's finished. Before God has completed the work that he intends for their life. And so many times it's a process of pulling it out and thumping it and putting it back and pulling it out and thumping it again. And God's been thumping on some of you to see, is he cooked? (laughs) Is the work that I have ordained for that, like that, their life is the work that I've ordained for that church, for that city, for that nation, for the church in this thump, thump, thump. Is it done yet? And if it's not, God's going to shove it back in the oven because otherwise it's half baked. And this has nothing to do with my message, <laughs> but it kind of does. John, the 11th chapter, you know this story. Word gets to Jesus that his friend is sick. As a matter of fact, not just his friend, but if you look, what does the Bible say? The one you love. Now, we only see one other individual that had that description from Scripture, and it was who? It was John. That among the disciples, there was the one, the three, there were the twelve. And yet, John he loved, but it says here about Lazarus as well. What does it say? The one he loved. This was the testimony that got to Jesus' ears. And he was obviously very intimate with his family, Mary, Martha, Lazarus. And so this was not a casual relationship. Jesus was somehow uniquely relationally connected and invested with this family. And in verse 14, he says this. He says, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified through it. You see, God had a plan and always has one, though our eyes and more importantly, our emotions don't get it. Because all we know is that there is this glaring need that is in front of us. And surely a loving heavenly father, being the good God that he is, will jump when he sees our discomfort, much less our pain. Now, if you get testimony back from somebody here at KC Lahaina that someone is sick, they're in the hospital, they're on a respirator, and it's serious, it's very serious, what do you, what is your very first response? Pray, but what is your relational response? It's to go. It's to move from where you are and to go and find out, is there anything at all that you need? Is there anything that I can do for you in this moment of stress and distress? And so the very first thing, I mean, I'm even, even people that are even casually related, they want to figure out what can we do, come on, to meet this need. I mean, right now, for instance, we've got thousands and thousands of refugees fleeing out of Afghanistan. And we've got churches, and, and, and most of them are coming through my city, Washington, D.C., Dulles International Airport. And as a local church, we're figuring out how to serve these people. I mean, we, I mean it, wh- whether it's housing, whether it's food, whether it's necessities of clothing, what, we're figuring out how do we meet their need in this moment of distress. And Jesus' response was to wait, 
two more days. Excuse me? The one you love is ill, and you're not moving. Uh, help, help, me, help me with that just for a moment. Why are, you, why are we not moving? Why are we not traveling to get there? His first response was to wait. Could it be that many times the greatest expression of divine love is delay? Now, remember when you were a child and you would ask something and your mom or dad would say, not right now. Later. You're too young. I'm going to die. I'm hungry. I need a snack now. And it's always 10 minutes before dinner. I mean, the ravages of malnutrition and starvation are going to descend upon your child if they... If they do not get cookies 10 minutes before you sit down for a meal. And the only way they know how to translate that delay is, if you love me, I could have the cookies. Correct? And yet, the greatest expression of your love for that child are the cookies after the meal, not before. And you put them in a place of delay, and their little three-year-old brain cannot process that, much less their little three-year-old emotions. You're just being mean. But you know something about nutrition and development and blood sugar that they don't know. And you realize that you've got blessing planned for them, but they just don't understand how it's going to unfold. Because they're thinking like what? Children. Stay with me. And in that delay, oh my gosh, there's despair, discouragement, fear many times. And we have to discern, is this a divine delay or is this a demonic delay? Because there are times that the enemy will get involved. He will stand on your air hose. He will stand on, your, he will stand on the water hose of supply in your life. There are times that the devil will try to take advantage and exploit these moments of delay. And to get in there and lie and say, if he were really a good God, he would let you have this and he'd let you have it now. And we have to discern. We have to step back when we don't see God moving in a way that we historically have understood him to move. We have to step back and say, God, is this of your ordination or is this an interruption, an interjection Of the enemy. Is it divine delay? And do we trust him in that delay? Oh, this is, let me tell you, it's easy when the healing comes. It's easy when the money shows up. It's easy. When the when the moment of delay has come to an end that we can get our get our worship on. But can we get our worship on in the delay? Do we, do we still trust him as much in the moment of delay when we don't see that which he's promised? Hmm. Wow. And the Bible is full of divine delay. Israel, 430 years in captivity in Egypt. Another 40 in the desert, 70 years in Babylon. And all of the false prophets that show up in Jeremiah that are trying to prophesy Israel out of God's dealing, they all wind up dead. Let me tell you, and there's a lot of false prophets on the planet today that are still prophesying out of their own imagination what the church wants to hear to try to get the church out of its place of 
current stress or perhaps even distress as to what's going on on the planet. Abraham and Sarah. Can we talk about delay for a moment? Our daughter-in-law, who is 42, had her first child. I mean, and she wasn't even supposed to be able to have children. I tell you, the, 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 the medical community, they get real excited about folk over about 30, is it 35 or 36, is it 35 years old? It's called, what is it called, a geriatric pregnancy. I mean, they're, they're really freaked out, let me just tell you. And yet, she delivered a beautiful, healthy boy, another perfect grandchild. <laughs> but talk about delay. Abraham, Sarah, and what was the promise? Genesis 21, the Lord visited Sarah, what? As he had said, the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised and Sarah conceived, bore Abraham a son in his old age. What? At the time of which God had spoken to him. But don't you know everybody looking around? Hey, uh, it's baby time. Yo, it's baby time. You know, and it's just like 50, 60, 70. It's just like, okay, well, I don't guess it's ever going to be baby time. Until... Not the optimum time to be having children. <laughs> and we can see over and over through Scripture, God delaying, setting something up for the manifestation of greater glory, greater expression of who God is. I mean, we look just back a few chapters in the book of John, right where we are. John, the fifth chapter, a man, it said he had been at the pool, hanging out for 38 years. Lame. For 38, and everybody knew it. My wife and I were in Israel a couple of years ago, and they have excavated this pool. It's not real big. But it was obviously very centrally located. And Jesus probably had walked by this dude hundreds of times, if not thousands. The thing that you realize going to Israel is how small everything is. How compact it is. And so the reality is, this man, reputa everybody knew who he was. Oh, that's the guy. That's, that's the guy. Like the gathering demoniac, that's the guy. And then, what is it that this day, 38 years this man had been lame, Jesus just happened to stop and say, um, okay, now. Seems a bit random, doesn't it? 38 years. We move up a few more chapters. John, the ninth chapter, a man blind from birth. We don't know how old this guy was. If he was a man, he could have been anywhere from a, a teenager up, based on what we understand about the transition between being a child and a man in that culture. But for some extended period of time, this man was without sight. Very interesting. And Lazarus, I'm going to hang out here for a while. COVID. You thought it was over with the vaccine. It's not over. We're still wearing masks. And we're still trying to figure out, you know, if the, whatever the variant, the, the, the next variant's going to be, that's going to pop up. We don't know when it's going to end, do we? But then what happens when God not only delays, but then God denies? What when God says no? So, oh, I don't understand why God would ever say no. It violates everything I understand about name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, confessing, declaring, decreeing. Everything that I thought I understood about being a Christian. You mean God would actually tell me no in a heartbeat and with a smile on his face? 
Don't kid yourself. Denying. And then we think that somehow we can move the no by getting a little bit more Pentecostal. (laughs) So we get a different posture of prayer. We start confessing. We start giving a little bit more. You know, whatever the thing is that we think we can do to somehow move the predetermination of God You know, we're going to somehow change God's mind. Did you hear me? We think we're going to change God's mind if we just pray a little louder and a little longer. Keep on thinking that. Second Corinthians, the 12th chapter. I think Paul knew how to pray. Because Paul stayed jammed up a lot. And you know this story? Three times. You remember this? Three times I asked that this messenger from Satan, now whether that was a demon, whether it was a physical malady, I have my opinion, and it doesn't matter what mine is about that because it's less valid or more valid than anybody else's, including yours. Whatever it was, Paul didn't want it anymore. And so what we see is some persistence in his inquiry of the Lord to rid himself of this discomfort. And God basically said, um, Paul, yeah, uh, yeah, I heard you on that. No. <laughs> now, the no is not specifically inscripturated for us, but we know that the answer was in the negative. I'm not taking this away from you. And why is that? He said, because I want to show you something about me that you would never get otherwise. And that is that my grace is more sufficient than whatever this discomfort is in your life. As a matter of fact, my grace could not be fully even known to you unless this was there. Y'all didn't get it. I don't have time to repeat it. You see, do we really trust him when the answer is no? Do we trust him in the delay, but do we trust him in the denial? But then comes the real test. Do we trust him in the death? Hmm. Now, I don't know of anything more final than death. Now, say, oh, I'm a Christian and I believe in resurrection. We'll get to that in a minute. But in terms of this life, death has a definite period on it. Not a comma, not a semicolon, but a period. It's pretty, it's pretty final. Death. And something dies around our life. And then the accusations start. Mary and Martha can't wait to get a piece of Jesus. And I don't mean in a good way. I mean in a bad way. And Jesus shows up and the sisters are on him. And what do they say? If you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. If you had not been so long coming, he wouldn't be dead. Amazing. He said, well, you know, I, we, this is the Jesus. This is the guy with the rep. They had enough faith to believe if he'd shown up that he could have healed him. But God was about to take them to another place. He was about to move all of their theoretical theology. Oh, I believe in the last days that there's a resurrection. Jesus is about to move something theoretical to being very practical. Very real that they're going to be able to see and they're going to have to grapple with now. Wow. The accusations begin to come. Even those, John 11, Jesus is overwhelmed in the moment. Jesus wept, it says. Shortest passage of scripture in the Bible. He's overcome by, because why? 
He was allowing his humanity, people that he loved that were in pain in that moment. There was an empathy that he had. Thank goodness. Aren't you glad that God is not just up there in some kind of distant deist? But he's involved in our lives, not only practically, but yes, emotionally as well. Some of them said, could he not, could he who opened the eyes of the blind could have kept this man from dying? Wow. But then we remember a couple of verses. The account back in John 9, the man blind, and they asked Jesus, who sinned this man's parents or him that he was born blind? Understand that that seemed like a harsh question, but it wasn't one of just epigenetics. It wasn't just one of, of, of cursing and blessing Deuteronomy 28. It was understood in that culture that congenital defects were always a result of some type of generational sin. Somebody messed up. This is the outworking of it. And God and Jesus gives him this amazing answer. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that what? The work of God might be displayed in his life. That should be one of the most disturbing passages of Scripture for you and for me. Wait a minute. You mean God would deprive this child, this family of a normal kid just to make himself known when he opened his eyes as a man? We actually serve a God that would delay and deny healing in order for his glory to be made known? Uh Uh-oh. John 11, what did Jesus say when he got report of Lazarus' illness? It's for God's glory that the God's Son might be glorified through it. And interesting, look at how subject and object shifts. It shifts from the need of the moment, Lazarus being at the center of the discourse, to the glory of God. Now, taking center stage. You see, so many times we've gotten subject and object completely confused. That somehow this is about me, my need, my gift, my ministry, me, mine, mine, me. How many personal pronouns can we use? And God is beginning to, and and God is trying to find out it's wrong. You got it all wrong. It is for my glory in the church. This is what this is about. It's not about. I love, I love 12, 12, 12. I love that. We have very similar vision statements in our church in the D.C. area. But when it comes down to it, it's not about metrics. It's about whether God's glory is going to be seen by him fulfilling those metrics. And that's not a subtle difference, ladies and gentlemen. It's not subtle. Death. God was setting up the tomb. Setting up the tomb. You know, this COVID crisis, pandemic, which I believe is God-ordained, Hate to be the one to tell you. Do I think the devil has exploited it? He always does. Anytime there's a moment of weakness, particularly in birthing and building, the enemy is always there to try to distort and destroy what God is doing. But I believe that God is doing, God, God has been setting the stage. The same way God was setting the stage to let a man die. And to let his corpse begin to decompose for four days. In a way that it was unmistakable. This guy's not in a coma. This guy doesn't just need fluids. This guy is dead. Unmistakably dead. And why is that? Because they... Objected when Jesus said, roll the stone away. 
I mean, that part of the world, it gets very, very hot. And we have no idea that that body had been prepared for burial. And it was like, man, you really don't want to do that. This is going to be rough. Jesus said, roll it away. And what comes rolling out of that tomb is the aroma of death. Now, this is very unsavory, but I'm just recounting scripture. Let me ask you a question. There is no odor quite like something dead. Would you agree with that? I mean, it's, it's, it's an odor that, I mean, you just know it. You know, whether it's something that's been hit by the road or something that's crawled under your house and it's like, honey, we're going to have to move. Because <laughs> I ain't going under there to find out. I'm just telling you. But you know, whoo, something, something expired. There's no odor like it. And there's something about it that's repulsive. Correct? I mean, we're not going, ooh, yeah, bread. Uh-uh. We're going like, whoa, dead. <laughs> so we're, 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 back, we're back in all front. We don't want to know. Could I submit to you that the odor of death is an aroma that goes up to God. And it gets God's attention. You know, we look at a lot of smells. It, particularly as we see temple, tabernacle, worship, whether it's the, the particular incense the priest used, you know, the perfume, whether it was, you know, the smell of the burnt offerings, it says that was pleasing in the nostrils of God. But we don't think about another odor. It's the odor of death. And God smells it. And believe it or not, God is looking for opportunities to glorify himself. Uh-oh. <laughs> Stay with me. You see, there's this kingdom principle of death before resurrection. You know, we all want miracle signs and wonders. Yea, verily. But none of us want the circumstances that set up miracle signs and wonders. We don't want a terminal four diagnosis or, or a stage four diagnosis from a doctor. We don't want sending home to die, getting your affairs in order, hospice. We don't want any of that. God sets up these moments. And we do everything we can to avoid death. Something in the human soul avoids it. It fights again. Even when the body is done and the doctors have said there's really nothing we can do but wait. Something in the human soul does what? It pushes back against death. Why? Because the normal functioning human condition is to live, not to die. We all understand that. That's why when we hear, when we read admonitions to pick up your cross and die daily, that's why everything in your soul says, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, I'm all about this life and life more abundantly. <laughs> Write me a check. But I'm not at all about dying. Why? Because you can't do it on your own. It has to be something spiritually that God enables you to do on the basis of the promise of resurrection. Amen. We do everything we can to avoid it. Artificial resuscitation. We've, doctors are today, they, 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 it, it's hard for them even to determine the point of death. Is it respiratory? Is it cardiac activity? Is it brain activity? I mean, to the point now that we've advanced so much that that exact moment of death is hard for medical professionals to determine anymore. But we knew Lazarus was dead based on the odor. What stinks around your life? Many years ago, before we were in ministry, my, uh, my wife and I were professional musicians. and I did a number of things like a lot, of, a lot of people do to try to put a living together. And so for the 10 years between college and a call to ministry, we did all kinds of different things. 
And I remember getting this letter from the Internal Revenue Service. And it was one, it was one of those pieces of mail that, you know, you can look through the little window and you can see, who did that check in there? There was no check. <laughs> you know, it was one of these penalty for private uses, first class. It's a piece of mail you never want to get from the Department of the Treasury. Let's put it that way. And I remember getting this and... This was just, gosh, maybe a, a few months before we went into full-time ministry. And it was a tax bill. And we not, had not evaded or avoided paying taxes, but it was a miscalculation. But it was a miscalculation that at that time was equivalent to multiple months of salary. We didn't have it. What even close to having? And I had been juggling, and you know how this goes, you know, Visa to MasterCard and cash advance and, you know, playing all these little dances, you know, trying to stay ahead of, I mean, some of you, maybe you don't, but just take my word for it. It's an ugly way to live, all right? And I remember telling my wife, "Wee, we broke. <laughs> had two kids, they were used to eating, you know, multiple times every day, you know, and it's just like, I have no means. I have no human machinations. I've got no imagination. I've got no tricks here. We are financially dead. And I started to laugh. And my wife thought, well, who do I call for this? Do I call the church or do I call the guys in the little white truck in the net? Because my husband has flipped out. <laughs> but I got happy. Because I realized that all of a sudden, any and everything that I had done up to that point was insufficient to stave off this moment of financial ruin and death. And then it's almost like God was standing there waiting for the last gasp and saying, can I do this now? Can, 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 can I do this now? How many times? Yeah, you got it. Within six months, not only had the IRS bill been paid in full, we were out of debt. We were out of debt. That's a cue for you. We were out of debt. <laughs> Unexpected financial resources that we did not even know were remotely on the horizon arrived at the door. A prophetic word in that fall of that year propelled us in the ministry. God did everything naturally he needed to do. And in January of 1990, we went into full-time ministry for the princely sum of $9,000 per year. Even in 1990, that weren't a lot of money. But if you're out of debt, you can do it. But it was preceded by what? was the prerequisite it's amazing and you know of all the things that we talk about in the church and I want to close with this we don't talk about resurrection much we talk about a lot of other stuff pulpits we talk we we we, we fill our times with making you a, a better Christian how to see you get blessed by operating in kingdom principles. I mean, there are a lot of, you know, therapeutic things that are preached from this desk. But we don't talk many times about resurrection. And yet, if you think about it, ladies and gentlemen, and Paul related it very accurately in 1 Corinthians 15, he talked about this. He says, if, if, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, guess what? Your faith is futile. So in other words... Everything that you and I believe is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's it. Period. Everything else that we talk about and we emphasize, it's all a byproduct of the product of the resurrection that Jesus defeated death and came out of that tomb. And yet we barely even preach it anymore. We need to be reminded. One of the reasons we fear death is because we're not grounded in resurrection life. That's why Paul goes on in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 15. He says, the last enemy 
to be destroyed is what? Death. The last one. That's kind of sad. It should be the first one. Because once you've defeated death, everything else, quite frankly, it's a walk in the park. It really is. And here Jesus is at that tomb, that odor. Folks are backing up. It's like, this is going to be ugly. And what does Jesus say? Lazarus, come forth. And here comes Lazarus. You think Lazarus would be, yo. <laughs> Lazarus is coming out. <laughs> little help here. Little, little help. Why? He's been wrapped in grave clothes. And what does Jesus say to the folk who are witnessing this? Unbind him. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus has done the heavy lifting of the resurrection. But he calls you and me as the church to unbind people. This is what you and I are called to do. I don't have the power. You don't have the power to speak to, de to, speak to death and life. Jesus holds that power. He holds those keys. And yet, he lets you and I participate. And he was saying, let, uh, let me help you with this. Let me, let me help you with, with, with that thought pattern. Let me, let me, let me help you with that, that, that curse. Let me help you with that demon. Let, let, me, let me help you with that. And this is what the church is called to do in a dead and dying culture, is to believe in the resurrection power of God, and then we're standing there watching what Jesus does, and we do our role in unbinding. And ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. Unbound people unbind people. Unbound people unbind people. There weren't a lot of folk, okay, Lazarus, I'm coming. Let me, let me see what I can do for you. Let me... I use my teeth. <laughs> and so many times we're looking to get free. We're looking to get blessed simply because we don't want to stink and be dead anymore. But in reality, what God is saying is that I have unbound you so you can unbind somebody else. Do you realize this is what the process of sharing the gospel is all about? Jesus is the only one, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, the God of this age has blinded the minds, blinded the eyes so that they cannot see. Why? They're bound. They're dead. This is when you and I begin to share our testimony. I once was, now I am. I used to be bound. I used to stink like death. I used to smell like sin, but now I'm not. Let me help you a little bit. This is the process not only of evangelism, but this is the process of discipleship that God has called the church to in this age. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we live in a culture that smells like death. We live in a culture that celebrates death. The culture wars have been fought and lost. Ooh. It's not getting any better out there. And if you're waiting for the right president, the right administration, the right government, if you're waiting for the right legislation to change it, let me just tell you, it's futile. Because none of that can change the condition or a man or woman's heart or their status of death to life. That is something that God has entrusted to you and me as the church. That's what we're called to do. The Bible talks about different smells. To one, the aroma of death. To other, the aroma of life. And that's the smell that's supposed to come off of us. And imagine for a moment the post-resurrection Lazarus. Seriously. Imagine. This is a guy that was dead. Now, remember, this is a small community. I mean, there was no internet, but there was a lot of this. And everybody knew who Lazarus was. And all of a sudden, his Lazarus, he's headed to the grocery store. Yo! 
I think folk called him Mr. Lazarus after that period of time. I mean, because once you've been in the grave and you come back out, can you imagine some dude coming up to him? It's like that old movie, Crocodile Dundee. You ever seen that movie? You know? Give me your whatever. Oh, that's not a knife. This is a knife. I mean, can, do you think any young punks were messing with Lazarus after that, Mr. Lazarus, after that period of time? Why? Because God had moved him from death to life. Ladies and gentlemen, God has done the same thing for you. The exact same thing. You stunk too. <laughs> Hate to tell you that. But you were not only offensive to God, you were an enemy of him. And you stunk just like Lazarus. God held his nose and he walked into your life and he said, come forth. Come forth. Come forth. This is what he did for every one of us who have received him as Lord and Savior. We read the story of Lazarus as a historical account, but every one of us are living history to that resurrection power that now resides in you and in me. And ladies and gentlemen, the church is desperately, excuse me, the world is, some, most of the church, quite frankly, but the world is desperately needing and wanting to see that. A lot of this. Not a lot of this. This is what God's called us to. For some of you in here this morning, and I'm landing this plane now, something's died around your life, and it stinks. What was once an object of affection is now an object of repulsion. Maybe it's a dream. Maybe a relationship. And it was something that was so attractive at one point, but now that it seemingly has died and seems to stink, you just want to walk back away from it. I'm here to tell you, he's a resurrection God. And the very thing that stinks around your life, it is an aroma that reaches up and it gets God's attention. And he says, now. I can glorify myself through my church. You know, many people prophesied the demise of the church as a result of COVID. To quote Mark Twain, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. But could I submit to you that there are parts of the church that desperately needed to die, especially the man-made parts. And we've got to figure out what needs to stay dead and what does God need to resurrect. Because there's some things around your life it needs to stay dead. Yeah. Please don't dig it up. It's just ugly. <laughs> Come on. But once we know that which God has apportioned to us, God wants to breathe on it. His ruach. His pneuma. He wants to breathe on his church. I believe a new Pentecost that God is wanting to bring, that miracles, signs, and wonders are not something we read about or talk about. It's something that we regularly witness and participate in. But it starts in you. You can't export something that you don't have. And every one of us know the heartache of delay, even denial, and yes, death. And I might add that over this past 18 months, all of those have been shoved in our face globally. We've lived in the valley of the shadow of death. I think you would agree with that. I mean, we all got, got, got a little... Mm, Morbid and maudlin looking at, at COVID. Who, how many died yesterday? Oh, my gosh. And yet, 
It's against this backdrop that God might be glorified through his son. And he's going to use the church as well. Pray with me this morning. Lord, let us, let us hear something of your spirit. Lord, every one of us in this room have experienced minimally delay. Some are in that moment where the answer is no, and some have even experienced death. As one preacher said, God never wastes a hurt. And God, whether it's the loss that's happened through this pandemic, that's touched many people, including many in this room, in profound ways. God, we thank you that you've always known what you're doing perfectly. You've never been distracted or disrupted. Never. You've always worked from a position of determination and deity. If you're here this morning, everything that I mentioned, it begins with a process of moving from death to life. It's called salvation. It's called conversion. And it's a miracle. Because if you could have changed yourself, you would have already done it by now. You can't. Only Christ in you, the hope of glory, can. And if you've never had a moment that you have yielded your knee, confessed that you aren't God, never will be, not close, but confess that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that's you this morning. Slip your hand up where you are. All right. Just talking to the saints this morning. Right now, I want you to give whatever's died. I want you to hand it over to God. Stop trying to resurrect it yourself. Stop trying to perfume it, make it better. Just hand it to God. And ask God, resurrect it. Maybe it's a dream. Maybe it's a prodigal child. Maybe it's a relationship that just seems like it's dead beyond redemption and resurrection. Hand it to him. Hand it to him. And watch what he does. Lord, we thank you that you are a good God. A good God. We trust you. We love you. Amen. Give the Lord a praise this morning. We want to do one thing in closing, and <clears throat> Dr. Morocco asked me if I would do this this morning, and I asked your pastor, and he agreed, but we won't, <clears throat> wow, look at that. Thank you, sweetie. We want to receive an offering for the conference. You know, I love the way that this, this King's Cathedral and chapels work together. You're one church in many locations. It's beautiful. And we know that what's going on on Maui is also going on, or excuse me, what's going on in, where is that? Kahaluni? Kahaluna? I can't say your words. It's, it's all right. But that other place over there, you know, the big house. What, whatever's going on inside the big house is also going on inside of this house. And so right now, we want to sow into that conference. We want to sow into those men and women, those prophets who have come ready to pour out that which has been poured into them. If you've received something here this morning, it is as a result of the overflow of the benefit of that conference. Amen? I got to tell you, I get blessed every time I have an opportunity to stand in front of you and in this house. And I trust that this morning that blessing extends and that you will respond to that blessing by giving. Amen. Let's pray once again. Ushers, just come do whatever you do. I don't know how you do it, but just do it, all right? <clears throat> Lord, we thank you. Lord, that you do it indeed give seed to the sower. And Lord, we thank you for that. We love you. God, bless these men and women now as they give, that this word might go deep into their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for giving. Pastor?
Come on, we can do better than that, King Chapel of Haina. That was a powerful word, amen. A challenging word. But are we going to accept the challenge, amen? Are we going to be the light in the darkness, amen? Are we going to exude the resurrection life that is in us, amen? Because the world is without hope. And I love, you know, throughout this conference, we've been hearing that. That Christ, the hope of glory, lives in us. You know, and even Peter said that there will come a day where we'll be asked to explain why we have this hope, amen? Why do we, why aren't we shaken or panicking? Because we come from a kingdom that cannot be shaken. When we know who we are and whose we are, we can stand in times like these. This is the time that the church should rise up and shine, amen? We can boast about the goodness of our God, amen? If we can all rise, let's pray. I'll just pray over the word to be sealed and then I'll have my beautiful wife come up and bless you guys in the name of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, I just lift up your people this morning, God. I thank you for the word that was preached this morning. And we know that there is an enemy, Lord, who would try to steal the word from our hearts, Lord, and prevent it from taking root that would bear fruit, Lord, fruit of righteousness, fruit that would bring you glory, God. So in the name of Jesus, I seal the word, God, in the hearts of your people, God. And I pray, God, that this would be a year, uh, I mean a week, God, to boast about the goodness of our God, to boast about the hope of our God, Lord, to be the resurrection light in this time, God, that we will shine bright in the darkness, God. And, Lord, we thank you for Prophet Creature and his wife for coming, God, and giving us this word in due season, God. I pray you bless them, Lord, in a special way. Bless their ministry, God, everything that concerns them, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. I'm going to bless you as you go or you can stay because uh, we got one more service in about 15 minutes. Hallelujah. Yeah. Call somebody. Tell them come to church. Praise God. Oh, and the ushers are coming around to collect your offerings too. Oh, we have a couple more here that have envelopes, please. Thank you. All right, let me let bless you in the name of the Lord. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your people, Lord. I pray you bless them as they go. Bless them in the field, in the city, Lord God, wherever they go, Lord God. Let them have, Lord God, your resurrection power flowing through them, Lord God. Lord, I pray you would anoint them, Lord God. Anoint them, Lord God, to release people from the binds, Lord God. Anoint them, Lord God, to loose people from the sin that entangles them. Lord, and I thank you, God, for your word this morning. May we go and live it out in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. God bless. All right, King's Chapel of Haina, we love you guys. Have a blessed Sunday. Online family, thank you for joining us. If you have any prayer requests, anything, please hit us up in the feed, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. All right? We love you guys. Aloha.